Hey everybody, welcome to Futurum Tech Webcast, Futurum Tech TV. I'm your host, Daniel Newman, Principal Analyst, Founding Partner, Futurum Research. Super excited today. Interview series, big news being dropped. I've got Nicole DeGaulle here, Qualcomm, the leader of the automotive business. You guys just wrapped up in just a few months, a mega deal to acquire a rival, uh, part of Vianeer. I wrote about it a ton, Nicole. You know what? I have a bunch of questions for you. First and foremost, just say hi to everybody. You've been on my show a few times, but you know what? I, sh I should slow down because uh, I want you to go ahead and just introduce yourself. Good to see you, Daniel Newman, and uh, hi everybody. Good to be with all of you. No, it's a it's a it's a good day today because uh, this was a record time. We announced the deal in October, and here we are, first week of April, uh, getting ready to close this and uh, get down to business. So. Super excited. Yeah, you moved super quickly. The deal got, you know, restructured a little bit in the process in order to make, uh, I think in order to make it move faster, I'll let you actually kind of speak to that a little bit. And now you're in motion. Meanwhile, there really hasn't been any slowdown in the automotive business. You guys have announced some pretty significant deals. Uh, Renault, uh, GM, BMW. I was at your uh, Snapdragon Summit. I was hearing from, I believe, uh, Mary Barra came in and spoke to us there. Um, the automotive thing is huge. Uh, when I had Cristiano on making markets, I think that may have been the topic we talked about the most. And I think a lot of my writing, Nicole, has been about Qualcomm Automotive. So, uh, so much going on. I guess, you know, really quickly, just as a little bit of a backdrop, um, talk about the deal as a whole, kind of what, where did it start and, and why did you go this route? So, you know, I think it's pretty clear that uh, safety technology is becoming pretty central to uh, everything automotive, everything vehicular and uh, safety gets you into assistance, into autonomy, into full autonomy. So there are very key building blocks that you have to have in place. And it's not just the technology, it's also the experience. It's also the market credibility. The fact that uh, you are writing software that is going into vehicles that uh, trust that software. It was pretty evident to us as we were expanding our automotive business. Look, we've, we've been doing great in automotive. I, I think it's been a Great fit for what Qualcomm is good at. It's a complicated systems problem. Uh, our customers need partners for the long haul. And the business approach that we have built with them and with the, and with the tier ones is all kind of centered around what we are good at as a company. Focus on next, next generation technology, be open in terms of the types of problem statements, do this globally, do it at scale. So a lot of those boxes were checked and we are doing really well in our connectivity business and in our cockpit business. ADAS was something that we initially engaged with with a silicon approach, and we did well with that. We won the GM business, we are launching later this year. So we knew that this is a very important business that we have to be in, but the stack was important for us to have because the stack is really what's going to be the application that allows what the vehicle is seeing to be relevant from so many vantage points. How, is the, how does the driver experience that? How does the car experience it itself? What kind of data do you generate from it? How do you learn from it? Uh, what are the new use cases you build on top? So the, this asset was a key asset and we kicked off the partnership with Bionier, as you know, you know, over 18 months ago. Uh, that collaboration was important to have in place because we've been working with our automaker partners uh, jointly for a very long period of time. So the teams have gotten to know, to know each other very well. We get very clear feedback from customers on what it is that they like, what they don't like. And so significant progress made in, I would say not even 18 months. I mean, Jan of 21 to April of 22, very short period of time. Yeah, lot, lot accomplished. Well, you know, by 2030, the consensus is the vehicle bomb will be something like 20% semiconductors. We've seen the world teetering on supply chain shortage that probably had too much lagging edge, not enough uh, planning in terms of uh, resiliency, but also companies like Qualcomm really just entering the space. And we all know the design, uh, the design process, even if you're winning all these deals, is $13 billion pipeline. It takes three, five, seven years. And that's starting to shorten because of the foundational technologies you're putting into place, but it doesn't happen overnight. We all know these automotive companies do not move 
particularly fast. And this is something also I see Qualcomm being able to significantly help with. Um, side note, I will be very excited to see Qualcomm uh, Snapdragon on the side of the Ferrari F1. They're having quite a year. I just wanted to throw that into the pod, not really relevant to the topic, but uh, my, it made my heart skip a beat. I just watched uh, Saudi Arabia just this few weeks past and uh, can't wait for Austin. All right, side note. But, you know, something I thought was really great about the deal was was the speed. Um, you know, just really quickly, deals of this size don't happen this fast. Complex deals of this size that have to be, bring in private equity partners to break up and distribute pieces of businesses in order for you to acquire certain assets, and that really tend to not happen this fast. How'd you get this? How'd you get this done so quick? Well, you know, I think the deal team that we've had is just fabulous. They've just done an outstanding job. The bankers, the lawyers, our own teams, uh, and then SSW partners have been fantastic to work with, and then of course the Bionier team. So. I think what was very helpful was that we had set up the concept of Arriver, which was the entity that we had initially partnered with and then wanted to acquire. That was something that was done about 18 months ago. So there was a clear notion as to what constitutes folks that are working on the stack that are separate from the tier one part of the business. And we had made it abundantly clear that that's what our interest was in. So when we structured the deal, it was set up for SSW to acquire Bionier and then we would buy the arrival portion from SSW. So th those are the plans. I think everything has gone uh, very much on track as planned. Obviously, we are going to have a very strategic and close partnership with Vionier going forward and with SSW because we are continue, going to continue to support them on their roadmap. They're going to need help from us and vice versa. We obviously have to support all of the customer obligations. So. I think it was a good plan up front. Uh, it was clear as to what everybody wanted from it. And uh, this isn't a deal where now that this is done, we are kind of off, uh, going, off on our, going off on our own. We're going to continue to work together with each other because uh, we have the same customers to go support. Partnerships are always critical in this business. I mean, automotive is, you know, it's an amalgamation of different providers and technologies that have to come together to make uh, what, you know, is a bit of a love affair. I mean, our relationships with automotive and vehicles is, you know, it's right there on par with our relationship with smartphones. So it's something that Qualcomm clearly knows a lot about. And in fact, the automotive one obviously has a much longer uh, history because we've we've had a, you know, especially, gosh, here in the States, I mean, we've, we've just had the longest love affair. But all over the world, people love cars. And, you know, now we've seen Tesla rise up and create a whole lot of visibility to what, we can do, you get rid of the combustion engine, you put motors on the wheels, you basically, the rest of the car is powered by a computer. I mean, it's one big tablet. You get in that thing and you're like, where's the buttons? I mean, and you guys are moving in that direction of saying, hey, well, you know, digital chassis isn't literally a chassis. A digital chassis is a modular building block approach, right? And so a driver is kind of a core piece of this. A driver is gonna basically, you already were doing the telematics, you were already doing the infotainment, you know, now you've added a new element that can basically say, we can go to GM, BMW, Renault, all these partner companies and say, you want to modularize your approach and have, you know, I'm not gonna say Tesla-esque because they're all gonna be their own thing, but you want to build your version of a car of the future, you can do it with us, building block, building block, building block until you get there. Yeah, you know, I think the reason uh, the digital chassis concept is so interesting is that for us as a company that is a systems company, we can go down to the unit level of an IP block that we design, and we know what all it can do. So for example, for silicon that we are, that we are building for the next generation, it doesn't differentiate between whether it is running a safety workload or a consumer workload. We know that the information that we have to manage has different use cases for different types of consumers. The car will need something that has much more critical need than say a consumer might. When you bring in that kind of thinking at the elemental level, and then you have to be able to go up the stack and figure out how you kind of build those Lego blocks, you have a tremendous amount of flexibility. So bringing Arriver in, what it does right away is it allows us to be able to write applications that are safe in nature. They're designed to be safe. The whole reason to bring the stack in is because it's a safe stack. Now, if I were to apply a safety application, there are so many different things that we can do with the technology across so many aspects of the platform that we are building, it provides tremendous flexibility for automakers to figure out 
what did they go do in a specific market? For example, if you want to put computer vision in a two-wheeler, we have the ability now to be able to design silicon that is for that specific tier, we run computer vision on that, and we will provide informational assistance. That's something we can do that we wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. If you want to be able to run surround view cameras for surveillance, something that we can basically do overnight. So the flexibility of having this functional software that is safe and then scale it across a very wide variety of underlying silicon and IT platforms, tremendous amount of power that it gives to us and flexibility for our customers. It's kind of in a, you know, for all us semiconductor folks, it's kind of like the best of all worlds. You got the best of general purpose, the best of the FPGA and the best of the ASIC. You got these applications, you got the flexibility to quickly change and adapt. And then you've got, of course, the power of the whole platform that can, can really handle everything that the companies need. And I think that's gonna be critical because one of the things I said earlier, Nicole, is that timeline is not acceptable into the future. As we are moving towards uh, more renewable technologies, as we're moving towards new infrastructure, cloud to vehicle com com communications, the, the uh, you know importance of data getting from the vehicle to government, you know, all these things are gonna depend on having, getting basically this obsolete technology off the road, the new technology on the road. And of course, not even, we didn't even mention safety profiles, which to add, being able to layer on the technology from L2 to L4 to L4 plus to, you know, adding next generation LIDAR technologies and being able to do that modularly. And these companies that work with you being able to say, you know what, if we partner with Qualcomm, it's not a, an all enclosed black box. What we're getting here is something that we can design now. And when there's something better next year, we can change and we can be somewhat dynamic. And that's pretty different, isn't it? Yeah, so I think uh, to work in the automotive space, uh, having an open approach and open platform is super important because uh, you know one thing that we have always assumed are the guiding principles is that at the end of the day, the automaker owns the end customer. And we have to be able to make sure that the automaker is successful in the relationship that they are building with their end customer. Because then, I mean, at the end of the day, when we ourselves as consumers buy vehicles, we fall in love with the brand, we fall in love with the experience that the automaker creates. So for us, the opportunity was always, how do we make sure that the center of the world is the automaker? And then what are the types of needs that they don't have? And we can't fulfill every need. We will not be able to be everything to every automaker. So you have to have an approach that is open where if they have done a tremendous amount of development in certain areas, where they have a lot of experience there, you have to allow that to be able to come in into the platform, and that's the approach we've taken so far. I think it's been, uh, you know, it's been it's been very. I mean, this partnership we announced with BMW in uh, March of this year is one where BMW and Qualcomm will get together and jointly develop the next generation drive policy that will go into BMW vehicles in 25, and then we will take that same software and scale it up to other automakers. And that is new. That isn't something that happens every day where, uh, and, uh, you know, where an automaker and a semiconductor supplier are working together to go scale something up. So there is also the aspect of you know, how much investment do you really want to see happening in this space? Because today there is obviously a tremendous amount of investment going in, but really for us, for a company like us, we have to make sure that the investment gets us to scale. And so the choices that we make are all tailored around, will the investment get us to scale or is this going to be something where we have a large amount of dependency on many other players to do their thing as well? That was also a reason why we had to own an asset like our in-house because we had to make sure that fundamental building blocks like safety, like perception, were things that we had a very good idea as to how to go manage and then how to evolve for our roadmap as well. Absolutely. Well, the edge and the vehicle and the connected intelligent edge, which is a big story within your organization and something I hear Cristiano talk about often, is the future. And the vehicle is definitely going to be part of that. You know, the way we operate and interact with these things is going to change whether we're even going to drive them in the future. You know, I'm still kind of hoping for that day that I can kind of just hit the chill button and, you know, log on or watch a show and just get to where I'm going. I think we have those now. They're called Uber. But I, I, I kind of like the idea of having my own uh, for utilization, <laughs> Nicole. Um, I want to end you with one last question for you. You know, I've covered this particular news for some time. I had the chance to do in a demo and, and, and ride in the Arriver uh, back at uh, IAA in uh, Munich. Um, you know, I, we work closely across the industry. 
with uh, both your competitors and your peers. I guess my big question is, between the time you made the deal and now, do you have any sort of clear, more greater clarity on how important and critical this is? Does it, how much faster this is going to get you guys to market? How much this might impact your thirteen billion dollar pipeline, et cetera? Because for me, that's kind of the biggest thing. Because I covered this uh, thoroughly, and I'm excited about it. I really believe it was a great move for Qualcomm. But what have you? What have you? Kind of insight can you glean um, now that you've got this deal uh, over the line? Yeah, so I think maybe the first uh, big takeaway would be, uh, you know, we are now engaged really in every conversation that we have with customers uh, around being able to provide a complete ADA solution, comprehensive ADA stack. So obviously the value of the deal that we are engaged with as we bring ADA into the mix is much larger than what we have been doing typically. So there is clearly a dollar value impact or will be a dollar value impact of the pipeline, and you will see that in the coming quarters. Uh, I think the other piece that becomes very interesting for us is that automakers are in the position now where they have to make choices on their partners. Who are they going to work with? Because you you can you can no longer afford to change your partners every few years. You have to be able to bet on a specific partner, and you bet on them based upon their long term commitment to the business. How well they've been doing? Have other people bet on them? their technology portfolio, their focus on the market itself, uh, their staying power, their history. And all of those things, I think, position us quite positively, especially now that we have done this deal, uh, in that we are prepared, we are ready to be able to scale up. You know, we, we, will, we will acquire about 1,100 people through the, uh, through the Arava transaction. Post-transaction, we will be about 3,600 people at Qualcomm focused on automotive. I think that is a pretty sizable team. If I look at the competitive landscape, that's a that's a pretty large team. So we are now fully resourced to be able to go after uh, much more business. And uh, you know, the other big thing, obviously, we have to do is to integrate and then to uh, start to deliver on the uh, roadmap. So uh, you know, that's work that we have to go do that we have known, and so that's kind of what we're going to be spending time on. Well, Nicole, as I always say when I'm providing my perspective as an analyst is um, the first part is always how good is the strategy and how good does it look? And the second part is how well do you execute it? So uh, clearly over the past few years, Qualcomm has been very um, clear with its intent to diversify its business. It's been clear that it's been able to succeed building multiple billion dollar businesses, uh, your counterparts in RFFE. Uh, your counterparts in IoT. Of course, you have built a multi-billion dollar pipeline and that you know, takes a little more time than some of these other businesses to translate. But I think this particular moment marks a, 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 a transitional point in which all the pieces are now here. And with all the pieces here, it's gonna be very interesting to watch how much this turns the business from 13 billion to 20 plus, you know, and that's the trajectory I see. And obviously under your leadership and under Cristiano's leadership, it does seem that anything is possible in terms of just how big Qualcomm can get in this uh, automotive space. So congratulations on the success. Thank you so much for taking a little bit of time with me on this busy day. Congratulations on finishing this deal in such a short period of time. And hey, I'd love to have you back sometime soon. So Nicole DeGaulle, Qualcomm's SVP GM, leading the automotive business. Thanks for joining me here on the Future of Tech webcast. Thank you very much, Daniel. Have a good weekend.